I'm going to be talking about the future of education and how we can get there, because we're in this enormous period of transition, as you all know. And I'm going to be talking about moonshots. And moonshots is a term that comes from my collaborator, Esther Wojcicki, who wasn't able to be here today. So I'm here today, and we work together a lot. And thinking about moonshots are the big things that we can do like when President Kennedy said, let's get to the moon within a decade, how can we make a really big move that makes a difference? And how do we get education beyond, beyond what we do today? We do a lot of good stuff today. We do some stuff that isn't as good as we could do. And I think there's a new kind of education emerging in the world. So how do we get to this future of education and teaching and curriculum and how do we do it by what I call vaulting the education cusp? So we have a cusp. If you don't know what a cusp is, it's a very sharp pointed mathematical function that we need to vault over. And the reason we need to vault over it is that if we don't, we just keep going up the one side of the cusp, which is a lot of what we're doing now. Another way to look at this is it's a move to plan B. This is something new. We do education. The education that we do all around the world is what I call plan A. It's the same education. It's the education of math and English and science and social studies and now computers. But it's the same, pretty much the same education around the world at different scales and different intensities and different depths. There could be a different kind of education. I call it Plan B. Now, I'm an educator, and I love to go around the world. And I've spoken in over 35 countries. I just got back from Chile yesterday. And I try to talk to educators about the future of education and see what they think is important. And then I try to see the world of education and the whole world from the perspective of young people. And that's something I have found that we don't do enough of, that we look at it from our perspective, we think of it top down as what the kids need, what we decide that the kids need, what we decided in 1892 or three, the Committee of 10 decided what kids needed, what we decide kids need, that's how we do it. But we rarely consult with the kids so that the top down meets with bottom up. I try to do that, so when I go around the world and speak, I try to have student panels. We don't have one today, but I would love to have one. We just had one in Chile. It was very, very interesting. And the kids always tell me what's really going on. They know because they experience it. How many of you have ever shadowed a kid or know what that means? OK, was it worthwhile? It was worthwhile. It means sitting next to a kid or going into the same room for a whole day and seeing exactly what that student experiences and lives through. And people have made very big changes, certainly administrators, once they see the world from the perspective of young people. So from all these experiences that I've had, I want to give you some thoughts and perspectives, new perspectives, things you might not have thought about before that you will leave maybe not doing something immediately, but hopefully this stuff will percolate in your minds. Because I look at the world a little bit differently than some people. And I, the perspectives are mostly about students. What I call today's global empowered kids. My sense is that the kids are really different in many senses. I wrote about digital natives 15 years ago. You may know that. I did things with games. I did things with other kinds of teaching and strategies. But now I think it's time to focus on these kids who are so empowered compared to what kids were in the past. And I mean that around the world. I don't just mean the kids who have all the technology in their homes. I mean every kid. And for those kids, I believe we need a new kind of K-12 education. This is a picture of High Tech High, which is one example of somebody going in that direction. But there are many, many little examples in the world. Unfortunately, there's no complete example that we can point to. 
and say, this country, this school district, this, even this school is all on plan B. But we're looking for a plan that will serve our global empowered kids differently than the kind of education that we offer them today. Now, I also try hard to think about what education could be and should be in this quickly changing world. We all know it's a quickly changing world. I look for trends. I look for the things that are emerging in different places. I heard about one of them at lunch. So they're emerging here in California. They're emerging in many places in the world. But it's typically in small nuggets, individuals, particular classes, maybe a school. So here's what I see in the world. I see that in this age that's characterized by a number of things that I want to cite. First one is accelerating change, but the emphasis can't be on the change as much as on the acceleration. We've all seen change. Our grandparents saw a huge amount of change in their lifetimes, but it didn't come as fast as the change today. It's not just coming fast, but it's accelerating, which means it's coming faster and faster and faster and faster, which means we're going to have to adapt to changing things that used to take us decades to changing them every day. That's how fast the world is moving. Second thing is this thing called VUCA. How many of you ever heard of VUCA? VUCA is a term, you can Google it. It's a term from military and also business planning. And it means that there's increased volatility, complexity, uncertainty, and ambiguity in the world compared to the past. Very much more so. So today, for example, we have to make up new words like frenemy, right? Because you can be a friend and an enemy, or competition. These kinds of ambiguity, we see much more up and down. Look at the price of oil. Look at all these things that are different today than they used to be. And the third thing is extended brains. And I've written about this. You call it extended brains, extended minds. Once you have that device in your pocket that has so many things on it that we Forget a lot of us, certainly me, what's on it, that I have a compass, that I have a video camera, that I have a flashlight, that I have all these things which every year and every couple of months if I download it or every couple of weeks, I get more. So my brain is extended in many ways by all these devices that we have. And that's not even the most important thing because what's really important is that those extended brains that we have are all networked together. And that's really, really important. We have a different kind of people in front of us. We have people who can deal better with accelerated pace of change and VUCA and extended minds networked together. That's what's happening. That's what we have to deal with. We don't know how. So we're learning. Our kids are increasingly becoming empowered. That's, I think, a very important thing to think about, that they can do things. And I love the, I don't know how many of you were here for the last presentation where the man was making films. Kids can make films overnight as homework. We call them films. They're not, there's no more film, but we still call them that. But they can do those things. They can make them. They can send them around the world. They can do things, even if they don't have the devices, they can think about doing these things and know that someday, Every kid will have this, and they will be able to do this. So the power of kids is huge compared to what it was in the past. And to truly serve these kids, I think education needs to be really, really different. So I'm going to try to give you some views on how it could be different and how it could be different in our lifetimes, because there are many things that we could do. We're hampered. We know we have lots of standards. We know we have lots of things that we're required to do as teachers. We have curriculum. We have all these things that we have to comply with. And yet, at the same time, remember, things are changing faster and faster and faster. So we know from just, if you just read anything at all, that reading and writing are not going to be enough, and arithmetic, basic arithmetic, not enough, that people need to be hired on not what they know, but what they can do, that relationships are hugely important. 
even more important perhaps than they were in the past because we're all linked together. And I think a fundamental misconception that people have in the world is that if we just improve sort of how we teach, if we just take our current curriculum or everything that we have and we do better methodology and we add more technology and more computers and more of this, we're going to get better. That's all we need. Maybe we'll add a few 21st century skills, which people talk about. But I think that's a misconception. I think that that won't fix our education because we don't have the right idea of what education is for the kids of today and tomorrow. Today, we see that the dollars, when we try to reform education, they go into a couple of buckets that we can describe easily. We try to get more kids into school, whether they're girls, whether they're girls in Africa, whether they're kids who've dropped out. That's one big piece. We spend money improving how we teach the Plan A stuff. We add STEM. We add technology. We do this. And Third, we add these different 21st century skills. We talk about the whole person. We talk about the, the uh, emotional and social learning. We add those things. But very few people are really at the bottom of that pyramid, which is, how do we change the whole thing? Suppose we didn't have education today, but we wanted to think of what it could be for these kids. Fundamentally, that's what I try to do. That's exactly where I'm coming from, because what we do today, as well as we do it, and even when we do it the very best that we can, I don't think is enough for the kids of tomorrow. I think we need to go beyond. One of the ways is from the math, English, science, social studies. You know, the acronym for that is really interesting. It's the mess. And when I talk about teaching the mess to kids, they get it immediately. When I talk about teaching it to teachers, they get it. And it's not that those things aren't important. Of course they are. It's that we do them in too much detail. And we do them the same exact way for everybody. And those are the things that make it a mess. But suppose instead we had a different core of subjects. We said, OK, instead of those four things being the main pillars of our education and having teachers that teach those things, suppose we based it on the kinds of things that kids are really going to need. Effective thinking. But not just thinking, which is most of what we talk about. Effective action and relationships and real-world accomplishment. Those are the things that our kids are going to have to be able to do in order to succeed. And they're going to have to be good, or as good as they possibly can be, at all of those things. So to get to that education, we just can't go along the same path. If we just do the mess better, we're not going to get where we want to get to. It doesn't matter how much technology we add. It doesn't matter how much engagement we add it's still going to be the wrong thing, even if we incrementally improve it, which we are doing every day. Every time you come to the Q conference, you learn a little bit more. You incrementally improve what you do, I hope. And that's good. But it's not enough. It's not enough for the kids in the long term. We need to vault over a big wall. There's a big wall that's standing in the way of our educating our kids. I call it the education cusp. And what it is, what I've seen, this is really my view after examining the world and listening to people and seeing what people are doing and looking at the reforms that are happening in every country. Remember, a cusp is this function in mathematics that goes in one direction, all of a sudden makes a very sharp turn and goes in a different direction. So we need to vault from what we do today, which I call Plan A education, the education that we've established, that we have, that we're all required to teach, that we do, that is the same pretty much at different levels of quality everywhere in the world. We need to vault over that cusp to something different that I'm calling Plan B. I'm going to describe to you what that is. It's from an education 
that exists for improving individual people. Remember, what are we trying to do? We're trying to improve the scores. We're trying to improve the outcomes for individual people. That's what education is about. We've got to make all these kids do. And we, want, we treat them, if we're lucky, as individuals, not always. We need to move from that to an education that improves the world. We need to move from, in, from improving our individual people to saying, you know, we had third grade in the United States, and the third graders really improved the United States. They improved their communities. They did this for the environment. They did this and this and this and this. And so did the fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth graders. And that, if we thought about that, and especially think of a country that's underdeveloped, like a country in Africa or South America, where I just was, if the school was about improving the world and learning in the process, then that would be a very different education. It's a different perspective. It's from the old K-12 paradigm, which we all know, to its academic learning. In some sense, the academics have hijacked education. It's all about the mind. It's all about the way we think. Now, that's very important. Critical thinking, very important. But that's not all that kids have to learn to get an education. It's about personal achievement. It's about the teacher knowing and being in control. And that's what a way it is in the world at varying degrees. It's moving from that to a new emerging paradigm of kids becoming effective. Effective at what? Effective at improving the world. They do that, as I will describe, through real world accomplishment, through projects that actually improve the world. This is possible to do at any age. Kindergartners can improve their neighborhood or improve their school. Certainly high school kids can do it. And the third thing that makes it work is that these empowered kids can do it themselves. They can manage themselves to a very strong degree, and there are lots of examples, if they have the right guidance from us. So if we are their coaches, this stuff can happen. It's moving from that curriculum of the mess to the curriculum of effective thinking, effective action, effective relationships, and effective accomplishment. And these things are not going to happen overnight, but this is what we have to be thinking about. And you know what? Very few people are. So what it requires, more than anything else to get to this, whether it's the kids, the teachers, the parents, the administrators, the politicians, it requires a change in mindset. It really requires how we think about education and what it means to educate our kids. Because if we get that change in the mindset, and when I say we, I mean the world, so this is a very large undertaking. If we change the mindset about education, once we shift that, the rest is going to follow. If we decide, as human beings, that we want to educate our kids to improve the world, it can happen, because it's very possible. And we know how to do that, and people are already doing it. So the reason I'm thinking about this plan B is not because it happened to bounce up in my mind. It's because I've seen the examples and the little bits of it here and there. And I happen to be a person who looks into the future and says, oh, you know, that's going to be important. So today's young people, I think they're already over, many of them. They're vaulting the cusp to the new way of doing things. They want to improve the world. They are doing projects, and we'll talk about some of them, that improve the world. They're going there on their own because they're so empowered. And they're doing it with us in many cases, a lot of us run these projects, help the kids through these projects. Some of them do it totally on their own. And there are projects that kids are doing all around the world that are out of school, that don't involve the teachers, but that involve improving the world and learning. So they know that every kid in the world, especially with technology, but even without technology, because we all live in this same hyper-connected world, they can accomplish far more in far less time than we ever could when we were their age. And
And they don't get the credit for this. They really don't get enough credit. Those that do go off often and do it. But we underestimate seriously what our kids can do because we have expectations that they're going to do the old mess stuff that we did. And that's the curriculum. And they may not be doing that. But that doesn't mean we should underestimate what they can do. These new global empowered kids in the United States, in every single corner of the United States, and in every single country of the world, and I can tell you I've been to a lot of those countries and talked to the kids, they're emerging. And they are so underappreciated. And if, you, if I had the panel up here, if I had eight kids up here, and I said, do you think you can do more than your teachers expect from you? They would answer yes. They did yesterday. They do every single time. And the upshot is that while we think we respect our kids, and we certainly want them to respect us, they feel disrespected. They feel underused and underutilized. And that's something that we could really change. And every single one of you sitting in this room could do something to change that attitude. And that will make a huge, huge difference. We need this new education. Again, we're not going to get to all the pieces of the education immediately. We're not going to throw out the mess and get to the effective thinking and action and relationships and accomplishment overnight. But there are many things that we can do in the short term to get to the education that's beyond. And I want to describe some of those things in terms of where we, we need to go with this. The first thing is the goal. The goal is improving the world. Now, how many of us ever stand up in front of our class and say, you know, that's your goal? We have a lot of kids who say, oh, I want to change the world. In fact, we hear that a lot. We hear a lot, I want to change the world. Well, changing the world is not exactly what we want to do. We want to change the world for the better. So that's the goal overall for society. The goal for individuals is moving beyond this goal that we have, individual goal of learning, to a goal of becoming. That's really what we want our kids to do. We want them to become what? Good, effective, world-improving people. If you're a parent, do you care about what your kid learned in math that day? Not particularly, probably. But you do care about what your kid is becoming. Is your kid becoming a bully? Is your kid becoming somebody who helps people? Is your kid becoming somebody who's effective and gets things done and gets projects done? Is your, can your kid point to specific things that he or she has done that literally made their neighborhood better or the world better because they're part of some movement in the world that's making it better? That's the goal. Education should be about helping people become. We evaluate kids on their grades on the mess. But we don't sit down. And I've always wanted somebody to do this for my kid, who's 10. Write down, what, what has he become this year? What has he become? What should he become? What could he do to become better? Not just at the individual skills listed on the report card, but at being a good and effective and world-improving person. Most of what they tell us to do, and most of what we do, focuses on learning. And we all know that. And we measure learning. And we try, and that's why we have these tests, and we try to do everything that measures and that affects, and we do research. We talk about learning. That's what school is really about. But the important thing to remember is that that's not what school is about. That's a means to what school should be about. Learning is a means to becoming a good, effective, world-improving person. So we have to figure out ways to help our kids understand what their real goal is and for us to understand. Because we can do that once we know to do that. And we have to figure out ways to measure becoming. We're very good at measuring learning, or fairly good at measuring learning, actually not that good. But we don't have any ways, really, to measure becoming. We don't even have good ways to measure accomplishing. Now, the second piece is a better pedagogy. Because now we do a lot of talking, but we've moved, and we're moving, and many of you have moved to 
project-based learning. How many of you have gone to project-based learning in one sense or another? A lot of you have, and many of you are thinking about it. Project-based learning is good. It's different. The kids do the things, and they learn through those projects, and they learn stuff that we want them to learn. But we need to go further, because those problems that we give kids are made up. Well, how do we make them up? We say, well, what kind of problem would cover all the standards? What would cover the common core? We can do that with real world problems. We can say, if you fix this in your school, if you fix this in your neighborhood, if you join this movement and do this in the world, you will make the world a better place. We just haven't put our mind on doing that a lot. But if we did it and thought about the needs of the world, because anytime if you asked any kid, what problems do you see in the world, locally or globally, they can tell you. If we put them to work on those problems, based on their individual passions and interests, which we really don't take the time very much to think about, some do, but not enough, we would go further. So here's some examples, just to show you that this is not pie in the sky. Some of you may have seen, or you can find it on the, on the Department of Education, US Department of Education's website, a video of middle school girls 3D printing hands, prosthetic hands for kids who don't have hands. OK, that's important. And there are site, there's a site that lets you, gives you the instructions to how to 3D print body parts of all kinds. They did this. But that's not even the most interesting part to me. What's interesting is here are middle school girls. They reached out to find out who needs prosthetic hands. What kids need them? They had a hand-a-thon where they literally made hands individually for kids who needed them. So this is peer-to-peer healthcare in the world. And there's lots and lots of projects that you could put in that category. A fourth grade class answered an RFP to build a new water park. Well, usually it's architects who answer those RFPs, but these guys won. They designed the water park. This is in the Midwest somewhere. And they were the ones who beat out the architects and actually designed the water park that eventually got built. That's a real world thing where they can point and say, you know what? We did that. Real world accomplishment. Another part of the US where high school students are restoring the ships. This is a maritime community that was always built based on wooden ships. They have a big wooden ship festival in Port Townsend, Washington. And they are restoring those ships. So one of the things that kids can do is restore our heritage in ways that we don't have the money or the time or the people to do these days. That's something that kids can do. This is one of my favorites. The school had to do an environmental report. What did they do? They used to hire consultants. What do we all do when we have environmental reports to do? One year, they hired their sixth graders. Do you think the report was any worse? No, it was better. Because the kids learned how to do an environmental report. Is that good? Yes. Does that mean that there are lots of things that government needs to do that we can't afford to do, whether it's from testing water to doing all the kinds of things that we run out of budget for that our kids could really help with and become better, more effective, more world-improving people by doing. Migrant workers. This was in maybe California, maybe Arizona. Who picked the fruit? Well, the kids have to, you know, you probably are aware of all the issues that the kids of migrant workers have with schools. Well, somebody went and decided, you know, if we get these kids together, we can give them video cameras and make them journalists. And they started doing real journalism that got on television. So these empowered kids can really do huge things. In Haiti, this is another huge one, disaster preparation. Chile was thinking about that. Suppose every kid in Chile, every year they did something to make disaster preparation better. So when they had that huge earthquake, or when they had the thing in Haiti, they could restore things because everybody was ready. All the kids could do these things. It means going beyond learning. So it means going beyond grades. And what happens is a kid would show up at an employer, this is the best part, not just with their transcript of grades, but suppose the kid showed up with a resume of accomplishments. Suppose they had done 10 projects a year 
for 12 years. That's 120 projects that the kids had done that they could point to. I took this role. I did this. I made this happen. That's what every employer is looking for. And to do this, what we have to do as teachers, we can get there. This is not something that we couldn't do right away. But we have to get past the idea of controlling kids. It's not that we don't want them to learn the mess curriculum, because we do, and they have to pass the tests, and we all know that. But kids who are doing the projects are much more willing and able to go there and do this because they get engaged. Because these projects are projects they choose. Not that we choose them for them. They're projects they choose based on their interests. They suddenly want to do this stuff. And there are examples. We, our job should be not to control them, but to empower them, to find out who can do things, to find out who's the best guy in the school or girl in the school in terms of technology, and make them the head of technology for the school. And suddenly say, you know, your school, your job is to organize all the kids you can and make your school the best technology school in California or in the United States. And suppose every school were doing that. And suppose we said that with lots of other stuff. We want to have our schools make our senior community, senior population be the best connected senior population in all of the world, or all of California, or all of whatever. That's what we could do. And in order to do that, we're going to need a different curriculum. And this is really forward thinking in a sense, but I, I challenge you to listen to some of this stuff. How we get to effective action, and relationships, and accomplishment, get beyond thinking skills, and even go to more thinking skills than we do today, because we really don't do that much. It's important because we have such a narrow curriculum. And that's, that amazed me when I first started thinking about it. We think our curriculum is wide, because it takes us more than the year to teach it. How many of you have ever gotten to the end of a year and said, oh, I finished the curriculum you know, two months early. Let's just do other stuff. No, we have these overstuffed mess curricula. But really, we teach only a narrow group of things. We teach mathematical thinking fairly rigorously. We teach understanding written communication, how to de decode and then how to interpret texts. We certainly do that. We teach some critical thinking more and more because we're focusing on it. We teach some scientific thinking, getting away more and more from the history of science into real scientific thinking. A little bit we do that. And we teach in terms of action, we teach writing. Certainly we try to teach writing, and we teach research. And then maybe we teach some citizenship and what it means to be a person in the United States, et cetera, or in other places. That's it. And maybe we teach some arts. You know, there are, there are a few things that we can put in and that we do put in. But that's really narrow compared to this. The important future skills, this is the set that our kids need. It's scary how big it is. Because we don't do any of those things, except what's in that little box, systematically. So our kids could leave school without knowing anything about these things. And just because we add a few of them, which we're calling 21st century skills, like problem solving and creative thinking and innovation and collaboration, those are important. But that's just a little drop in the bucket. That's all the things that we don't teach systematically today. And because that's a list that you can't read and it's far away, I'm going to take a second or a few minutes here to go through them and show you what they are. So problem solving, we do some of that collectively and individuality. Curiosity and questioning, we heard about that. Creative thinking, design thinking, which has suddenly become very big in the world. Integrative, systems thinking, financial thinking, we hardly do enough of that. Inquiry and argument knowing how to argue something, judgment, which is probably one of the most important things, transfer, aesthetics, habits of mind, positive mindset that Carol Dweck talks about, stress control, focus. Some of these things we're starting to do. Some of the KIPP schools are starting to do some of these things. Most of these things have curricula somewhere or other that have been developed. 
contemplation, meditation. And here's the biggest one I think that we're missing, self-knowledge. Kids don't know who they are, what they want to be. When they get to college, they're floundering. How come they didn't spend those 12 years learning about themselves, what their strengths are, where that might lead them in terms of future careers, not past? But that's just thinking. Now the action skills. Gee, how many of you read the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? It's a great book. We know those habits. Somebody did a huge study. We've known them for 35 years. Do we teach them to our kids? We know the skills of making you effective. We're not going to teach them to you. Does that make sense? Agility, adaptability, leadership, not just leadership, but followership, because we're not all leaders in everything. We take turns. Some things we lead, some things we follow. Experimentation, decision-making under uncertainty. Kids learn that in their games, but not in their class. Same for prudent risk-taking. Reality testing, feedback, patience, resilience, grit. Oh, we're just starting to hear about somebody teaching, Angela Duckworth teaching grit. Entrepreneurship, innovation, improvisation, ingenuity, strategy and tactics, breaking barriers which confront all of us, project management, programming our machines, which suddenly we're starting to focus a little bit more on, video making, and innovating with all these future technologies like artificial intelligence that are coming into our lives and that are going to dominate our lives in the future. We don't focus that. Now, it doesn't mean that we, we don't have time to devote a whole year to any one of these, but we certainly have time to devote a week or some amount of time systematically so that our kids are aware of all this. And that we haven't even talked about relationships. So collaborating and communicating one-on-one, -on -one, okay, we probably do that some. But what about in teams and in families and in communities and at work and online and in virtual worlds? We don't teach our kids to do this very much. With machines, how do you collaborate best with machines? We rarely spend time systematically on listening. We may talk about it and networking and relationship building and empathy and courage and compassion and tolerance and ethics and politics, which is so important in the world. Conflict resolution. People want a peaceful world. I know lots of schools who say our goal is a peaceful world. Do they teach conflict resolution systematically? No. Negotiation. People send their kids to negotiation courses after college. Why aren't they learning in elementary school? Peer-to-peer, -peer, coaching and being coached. All of those things are things kids need that we just don't focus on. We need a curriculum that puts those in some kinds of categories like thinking effectively and acting effectively and relating effectively and accomplishing effectively. That's really what we need. And that has to be combined with knowing about the world, what the military and others call situational awareness. You better know what's going on around you individual passion, what you like and who you are and what you can do, and, of course, and this brings us back to Q, the powerful use of technology. And this is a new matrix. It's a different way of looking at education. It's education based on real-world accomplishments where everybody learns about situational awareness, global and local, where everybody learns about effective thinking and action and relationships. And then different kids learn about the STEM and the humanities and the arts in different ways as they need them for the different projects. That's a different approach to the world. That's plan B. Now, since we're here at Q, let me talk a little bit about technology and just say, too many people, and probably you are not in this camp, but you know others who are in this camp, use technology as paper. It's just an extension of what we used to do before. We did things before, but here's the thing. And again, I hope you all know this because you're here. If you don't, this is a really important thing to take away. Technology is a foundation for education. In the same way, reading and writing have been a foundation for hundreds of years. 
None of you would teach a course and say, I'm not having my kids read or write. You don't need that stuff. It's optional. No, we wouldn't do that. It's foundational. Technology is now foundational. And I heard this from a kid. And this is really important. This moved me more than almost anything else I've heard. You see technology as a set of tools, often optional tools. We see it as a foundation. It underlies everything we do. So that's one important thing about technology. Second, technology is an amplifier. This is, there's a really good book called Geek Heresy that just came out that talks about this. But what that means is that whatever we do in education, technology will amplify it, whether it's good or bad. If what you use technology for is drill and kill, you'll get an amplified drill and kill. If what you use it for is something good and that we couldn't do before, that will be amplified. So there are lots of things that we do that I call trivial. All of these things. So if we're just writing online and not sharing it with the world and getting feedback, that's trivial. Or researching online or doing online textbooks, or online videos, or texting with colleagues. We could do this stuff before. We could connect, we could do all these things. So they're important, because the future is moving to new ways of doing things, but they're not what's really important for our kids about technology. So what is? What are the new things that we couldn't do before. And this is really important to think about when you use technology. Am I doing these kinds of things? We couldn't connect in real time. And now we can do it with video, we can do it with voice, we can do it with text, we can Skype, we can tweet, we can bring in experts, we can have a team member from another country on every single team we ever have in class. We can have a senior be part of our team. We can have kids who can't make it to school be part of our team. We can use these thousands and thousands of databases that exist in the world. There's a database of every plane in the air at the current moment. We can use those and integrate those and ask questions about them by using things like Wolfram Alpha, by using these computation engines and artificial intelligence that's baked into our phones because Siri connects to Wolfram Alpha. We can simulate things that we never could, not just machines like this, but also the human race. We can simulate all the 100 billion people that have ever lived and do things like where does DNA come from? Where do all dogs come from? They just found out last week they all come from the same place in Central Asia. We can do those kinds of things that we never could do. We never could program the powerful machines. Now, I would say every single class has at least one kid who can figure out how to program an app. So every class can be making apps. Other kids, if they don't know how to program, they can either learn or do content or do other stuff. We can all do this stuff. We need to be doing it. We need to be 3D printing. 3D printing, which now, you know, it used to be a little toy and it still is in lots of places and we print cute little plastic things. No, now they print parts of rocket ships. Now they're printing pieces of the body. Now they're printing graphene, which is the new material which is one atom thick, which is going to really transform everything that we're doing. So this is huge for the future that kids need to know about. Virtual worlds. They're all doing it, whether they do it in games or they do it somewhere else, or not all, but many of them are doing it. They know about it. We don't use it as much, or robotics. And robotics bothers me because sometimes we do robotics to play games. First Robotics Clubs, well, I love Dean Kamen and First Robotics, but they're shooting balls through hoops. What we really need to do with robotics is find landmines, is solve problems, is fix things that are wrong in the ground, is find chemicals. Kids can design those kind of robots. That's because they're so empowered. They need to be doing all these powerful uses of technology to accomplish real world objectives so that they can become good, effective, world-improving people. That's what we need to do in education. It doesn't mean we have to cut out everything we do today. We don't have to cut out the mess. It's very important. You can't build robots without math. 
but we don't have to do it the same old systematic way for every kid. So it is a new matrix. I just show that again because that's so important. That's another way to think about education. This morning's talk was about optimism. How many of you were there? Okay. I'm a huge optimist. And the reason I'm a huge optimist is because I look at the kids. I'm an optimist about them. If you look carefully at our kids and what they can do if we don't put our prejudgments on them and we're not talking about the mess, they can do amazing things. And all kids can do that everywhere. That's what I found and that's what's so important. But they need an education that doesn't exist. Pieces of it exist. It's slowly emerging. But we are going to have to create it. So everything that you do, if you think about this stuff, if this rattles in your brain in some way, in addition to teaching the mess, which you have to go back and do, you need to think about this future. We're going to have to vault this education cusp from the plan A to the plan B education, from the old paradigm to the new paradigm. And most of us currently are stuck on one side, right? We're all on the plan A side, almost all of us. Some are balanced at the top. Very few are on the plan B side. But the future is where these kids need. They need to be on that plan B side. They need to be effective. They need to do real world accomplishment. They need to learn to empower themselves to work on their own in order to succeed. So how do we get there? Well, lots of our minds, remember this goes back to your mindset. If your mind is planted on the A side of the cusp, you're not going to go to the B side. But if you know about the B side, and you can't get there, you might be in the situation that a lot of our people are in, impaled, impaled on the cusp. You know that there's another education. You know that what you're doing is not exactly what the kids need, but it, you don't know where to go. So I'm trying to help you think about where to go and how to get over that, how to get to the new emerging one. Now, especially here at Q, we can ask, does it happen through technology? And the answer is partly yes because the technology is so incredibly important. I don't know uh, how many of you have seen, I think I have a second to show, how many of you have seen Hound? This demo of Hound, let's see if it plays. Okay, it needs... 3 a.m. the next day in Tokyo. What time is it in Tokyo when it's 2 p.m. in San Francisco, California? It is 6 a.m. the next day in Tokyo when it is 2 p.m. in San Francisco, California. When is the sun going to rise two days before Christmas of 2021 in Tokyo, Japan? Sunrise in Tokyo, Japan will be at 6.47 a.m. on Thursday, December 23rd, 2021. How many days are there between the day after tomorrow and three days before the second Thursday of November of 2022? There are 2,714 days between the day after tomorrow and Monday, November 7th, 2022. What is the population and capital of Japan? The population of Japan is 127,288,000 and its capital is Tokyo. What is the population of capital of Japan? The population of Tokyo is 8,336,599. Okay, so the technology is just getting incredible. It will do these things, that's, that's the replacement for Siri, but Siri is going to catch up and go, all the other kinds of Siri AI. We have to teach our kids to use this AI and not think that they're in another time where you really didn't need it and it was extraneous and you have to do that. Yes, we have to do that. We don't do that. I was just talking with some people the other day and they were talking to me about days without. So can we, do a, can we go a day without our backpack? Can we go a day without our computer? Can we go a day without our phone? I'm thinking about days with. Can we go a day where all we do is use AI? Can we go a day where all we do is not use the enhancements that are on our phone? Can we go a day where we do things with? That's really where we want to be going with our kids, not taking back. But the interesting thing is we can't do it through technology only because the technology only amplifies the people. So we need teachers. We need teachers. And we have to move from the teacher control to the self-management because the job is changing. 
the job is from delivering content, which it used to be, to doing what technology can't do. What's that? Respect, empathy, motivation, passion. The kid's passion. That's your job. That's your real job as a teacher these days. And some teachers, Esther Wojcicki, who wishes she could be here today, is doing this. She wrote a book called Moonshots in Education. I highly recommend you all buy it and read it because she'll show you how to do this. She's been doing it at Palo Alto High School for 31 years. And her strategy is trusting her students. That's the huge strategy. That's the key. She has a, her own acronym, which is TRIC. Trust, Respect, Independence, Collaboration, and Kindness. That's your job. It's not the content. It's partially the content. Don't get me totally wrong. Kids should learn the content. But this is what the kids will remember and what makes you a good teacher. What they need from you is trust and respect. And to get it, these global empowered kids are adapting. They're not just the first internet generation, but they're the first horizontal and global generation. They're more like each other around the world. Kids are more like each other in California and in Singapore and in Shanghai and in South America than they are like their parents. And it's scaring parents to death. And we should think of those kids sitting in our classroom, if we really want to be thinking about the future, as extended brains all networked together. Suppose you thought of your kids that way. What would you do differently? So we need to find new ways because we don't want to just go up that same plan A cusp. So how do we do it? Well, we do it in a couple ways. You, change happens when dissatisfaction plus vision plus examples get bigger than the resistance to change. We have lots of dissatisfaction, no question. We even have some examples, but we don't have a good vision, and that's what I'm trying to tell you with the plan B. There's lots of resistance, but the vision is what's missing. So we have to redefine our goal as becoming and improving the world and not as learning. Don't confuse the means with the ends because that confuses the kids, it confuses us. We don't even know what our goals are for education. We spend so much time thinking about learning, we forget about what our kids are becoming. And how do you become? You redefine the means to real world accomplishment. That's what builds self-esteem in our kids. That's what shows them that they can accomplish. And people are doing this. This is a school superintendent. Before I approve a project, show me how it improves the community. So we've moved from direct instruction to project-based, but we have to go to real-world accomplishment. Not just the made-up stuff, but real problems based on the world that are based on the individual passions. So we get a resume. And we support that with the curriculum. If we want them to become, and where means is real-world accomplishment, we need the curriculum that moves from the mess to a broader curriculum of effective thinking, effective action, effective relationships, and effective accomplishment. Situational awareness, individual passions, powerful use of technology. We can do that. Little by little, each of us can do pieces of that and build this new matrix. Because today, it's just totally an underestimation. When the people say, don't experiment with our kid, we have to say we have to. It's irresponsible not to experiment in these times because they live in a never-before-seen context that's so different from the one we grew up with. That's my typewriter from college. We don't know how to do it. So we need to experiment. The world needs a new curriculum. That's my book. And if you're a person, young or old, who wants to improve the world, make it a better place, these are the most exciting times. We used to plant and harvest for thousands of years. Then we built the world for, thousands, for a thousand years. Now we're exploring new places, the brain, the universe, virtual space. We're at the ground floor of a very new world to come. 
full of imagination, full of creativity, full of innovation, full of entrepreneurial spirit, full of digital wisdom, I hope. I'm a huge optimist, but we are going to have to create that education with our kids because it doesn't exist anywhere. So let's begin from wherever we are to vault over this cusp that now you all know about to the new paradigm of education and a new curriculum, remembering, and this is what I want to leave you with, that the two most important words that any of you can say to your kids are these. Surprise me. And the teachers who do that and say that get surprised and they get the best stuff. So the world needs a new curriculum, moonshots in education. Thank you very much.